We live in the devil's world that's troubled with sin We look defeated but we know we will win Although we suffer and have sorrow and shame We know he's faithful and rejoice in his name Cause we're just like him Remember what our Lord has said Take up your cross and follow me Take up your cross and follow me Take up your cross and follow Everywhere you go today it's I, me, me, mine Look out for number one and don't waste my time But the Lord didn't teach us to live life this way He said to love and serve each other today And we'll be just like Him Remember what our Lord has said Take up your cross and follow me Take up your cross and follow me Take up your cross and follow He came from heaven above To serve with sacrificial love To give an example out of love our neighbor that he paid and leave behind our selfish plans that we made obey and love him with all of your might and don't forget to always walk by his light we'll be just like him remember what our Lord has said take up your cross and follow me take up your cross and follow Uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. And uh, we're going to, uh, we're rapidly coming to the end of um, the ninth major section of 1 John. We're already in chapter 5 of 1 John. So uh, we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 here this evening. Where in this passage, we're going to teach that, uh, we're going to see that John's teaching in 1 John 5, 3, that loving God is defined by obeying his commands, and then he describes God's commands as not being burdensome. So we're going to find out what does he mean by that they're not burdensome, and we're going to find out that, uh, again, we'll talk about how obeying God is demonstrating your love for God. Uh, this passage, as we'll see, is not talking about God's love for us, but our love for God, and it's a big difference. And so uh, you should be at 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. I have you there as, as, because we're... Uh, 1 John 5, 3, which finishes off the ninth major section of 1 John, begins at 1 John 4, 7. So I'm trying to study 1 John 5, 3 in that context. So uh, and uh, so again, we're coming to the end of 1 John. And I've um, uh, when I complete 1 John, um, that'll uh, I have, um, the next book I want to do is going to be Haggai in the Old Testament. It's two chapters long, good book, talking about the rebuilding of the temple and Jerusalem after the Babylonian deportation. And uh, after before that is a, I'm going to do a series on the remnant of Israel because we talk about the remnant in Haggai and we've talked about it in Zephaniah and Daniel and other places. So uh, that's uh, 
what I plan to do. We'll see how it goes. So uh, you should be at First John chapter 4, verse 7. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. Uh, we do this, to, of course, as to those who are here every night and listening to me uh, regularly. Uh, we take this moment of silent prayer to make sure that we're in fellowship with God. I never, uh, because we have so many people that pop in through the website and uh, listen to our classes through YouTube or Facebook. That people, you'd be amazed how many, we post it on Facebook, we post it on YouTube, the classes, on our website, of course. So some people, they just catch us on YouTube. It's kind of funny. And uh, they don't hit our website, they go to YouTube. But there are some people, I had a guy, you never know who's going to listen. There was a guy who made a, a comment on one of the classes I did on Titus back in 2014, and he really liked it. I was like, I see, I never knew this guy existed. So I don't know who, I say this because I don't know who's listening to us. And so I don't know if these people know these things. People, Those people who are with me regularly, they know these things, so it's repetition for you. But uh, don't take that for repetition for granted because uh, there are people like you in the audience and me who heard this stuff before class and yet now they don't think they have to confess their sins, which you've heard me say many times is uh, a big issue back where I came from, Massachusetts, and so in other parts of this country. So I have addressed that with Pastor Jim Ricard in the past. In fact, on our website, the articles we wrote regarding to these things uh, are like in the thousands, the number of hits. So there's a lot of people uh, that uh, I know of that associated with me in the past that have been affected by this false teaching that you don't have to confess your sins to be restored to fellowship with God and the filling of the Spirit. So um, don't take these things for granted what I'm going to say in the next few moments. So uh, for, those who it's, for those who it's repetition for. Uh, so we take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we're in fellowship with God. We ensure the fact that we're in fellowship with God by confessing our sins, as 1 John 1, 1.9 teaches. And we maintain that fellowship because see confession restores us to fellowship with God. And we maintain that fellowship by our, by our obedience. Now, we're restored to fellowship with God through the confession of sin. Uh, based upon the merits of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And of course, we were justified, saved, uh, it, 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 through the merits of Jesus Christ, the object of our faith, and his death on the cross. So in the same way that we're saved in the first place, or declared justified uh, through faith alone and Jesus Christ alone, so in the same way we're restored to fellowship with God because of the merits of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. I mention that because some people disassociate Christ's death on the cross with confession of sin. We wouldn't have the restored to fellowship through the confession of sin if it wasn't for Jesus' death on the cross. So a lot of uh, a lot of Christians I know are, are confused about that. And, and and the reason why they many of them are is because they really weren't taught these things that you have been taught. And uh, so I know who they've listened to and they haven't been taught this from the very beginning and they should have been. So no wonder there's been confusion. So you should be at 1 John 5, uh, 4, 7. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for this beautiful weather out here in Iowa and uh, the nice, uh, dry, uh, comfortable weather out here after so much rain that we had. Thank you for getting the rain out of here. And I know it serves a purpose, but I thank you for the beautiful weather that we're having. And um, so I just thank you for that. We all do. And Father, I just thank you for uh, the fact, that, thank you for the bodies that we have, the souls that we have, that we can experience and enjoy creation and also experience fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we just thank you for uh, all the blessings that we have because of our so great salvation, get, delivering us from sin and Satan in the, in the positional sense and also in a perfective sense when we get our resurrection bodies, but also we can experience it now in an experiential sense by walking in obedience to your word and appropriating by faith our identification with your Son, Jesus Christ, and his death and resurrection and thus considering ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God, and also obeying the command to love one another, and all that involves, and being forgiving and patient with one another, and tolerant of each other, praying for each other, help us in uh, serving each other. I pray th uh, that all of us in this ministry, would, uh, who are connected to this ministry, not only here in Iowa, but on our, the people following us on the internet, I just pray, Father, that your word would uh, work, Spirit would work mightily and powerfully through the teaching of First John, and also in our Sunday classes in First Thessalonians. 
I pray, Father, for each person in the audience. Thank you for each one of them. I pray for each one in the audience. Uh, each one of your children would uh, help humbly in uh, uh, taking into consideration everything that will be taught here this evening. Help them to understand what's being taught. Guide them in the application of the things that they're going to learn. And we just pray that you would help them to, uh, by the power of the Spirit, uh, I pray that the Spirit would conform them into the image of your Son as a result. I pray that you would help me uh, by the power of the Spirit to uh, communicate accurately your word to your people and help me to be sensitive and humble to the Spirit's guidance and direction. I pray that you would also help Titus with the sound of the recordings of the audio. We thank you for his service, the technology, people taking advantage of it. We thank you for Titus and Jody's hospitality. And also, I just pray, Father, for Cheyenne and her laryngitis. I pray that you get rid of that and heal her of that so she doesn't have to deal with it. And I just pray for the service. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. You should be at 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. I'm going to read 1 John 4, 7 uh, through 1 John 5, 4 in the Net Bible. It goes as follows. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God, and everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God. The person who does not love does not know God because God is love. By this, the love of God is revealed in us, that God sent his one and only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God resides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we reside in God and he in us, that he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God resides in him and he in God. Remember when it says resides, that's talking about fellowship with God and, and the believer's fellowship with God and God's fellowship with the believer. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has in us. God is love and the one who resides in love resides in God and God resides in him. By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because just as Jesus is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears punishment has not been perfected in love. When it talks about perfected there, we're talking about the manifestation of God's love it fulfills its purpose in us when we obey the command to love one another. So the purpose of God, one of the purposes of God revealing his love, his love at the cross through his sacrifice of his son is so that we might live through his son and, uh, and fulfill his, in the, when we obey the command to love one another, we're fulfilling the purpose of him manifesting his attribute of love at the cross. That's what all verses 17 and 18 are about, as we pointed out. We love, verse 19, because he fir- loved us first. Again, that echoes what he said in verse 10. Verse 20, he says, If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his fellow Christian, he's a liar. Because the one who does not love his fellow Christian, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And the commandment we have from him is this, that the one who loves God should love his fellow Christian too. Now we have chapter 5, verse 1. No chapter break in the original. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been fathered by God. That's regeneration, the spiritual birth, being born again. When he talks about being fathered by God. And everyone who loves the father loves the child fathered by him. By this we know that we love the children of God. Whoever we whenever we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments do not weigh us down. Because everyone who has been fathered by God conquers the world. Now, interesting, a little bit of translation uh, 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 differences in the translation with regards to the phrase in verse 3, for this is the love of God. Notice it says love of God. The ESV, they translate this verse For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. However, the the NIV, today's NIV, they say, in fact, this is the love for God. Big difference. But so when it says love of God, the translators are of the ESV and the Net Bible are basically saying that it could be interpreted as a subjective genitive. Uh, God's love for us, or an objective genitive, our love for God, or sometimes they call it a plenary genitive in Greek grammar. It could be speaking of both sometimes. It actually can. The writer means both. But the, 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 the um, 
The ESV and the Net Bible leave it open for the interpreter. Whereas the Net, the today's NIV, they come out and say the love for God. And the Christian Standard Bible, another great translation, they say love for God. And uh, the Lexham Bible, they're like uh, the, the NIV, uh, the, uh, the Net Bible, the ESV, they say love of God. Uh, the, uh, let's see, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Good News Bible, they say love for God. So which is it? Love for God or is it our love for God or is it God's love for us that's in context? Well, the, in- the interesting, one of the reasons why I like the Net Bible is they'll give you a note on this and explain why uh, this issue. Uh, they say, like I said, once again, the genitive could be understood as one objective. That means our love for God. Or it could be subjective, God's love for us. That's what that means. Or it could mean both. Sometimes it does mean, it could mean both. And here he, they say an objective sense is more likely because a believer's love for God because in the previous verse it is clear that God is the object of the believer's love. So the context is going to t- context as the Net Bible points out is telling us that because of the previous verse that we're talking about God's love, uh, our love for God, and why? Because we're talking about obeying His commands, which demonstrate our love for Him. So that's why we're going to translate it. Uh, one of the reasons why, major reason why we're going to translate, in my translation, it's our love for God rather than God's love for us. So in the ESV, they translate, for th- they say, their translation of verse 3 as follows, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now when he says, for this is the love of God, that's presenting the reason for the assertion recorded in verse 2 and, and it's expressing the idea that divine love for God the Father is defined by the child of God conscientiously obeying the Father's command. So when it says, this is the love of God, the word is can be translated defined. This is how we define love for God, that we keep his commandments. So the word is there, the idea and the, the verb in the Greek, it's kind of like, it, this is how we define it. And so when he says that we keep his commandments, that's I, de- uh, defining for us our love for God. What is that? that we keep his commandments. So that we keep his commandments is identifying specifically for us what defines divine love for God the Father. And then when it says in his commandments are not burdensome, that's not only connected to the previous assertion, uh, but it's also marking a transition for us, as we'll see later on this evening, from the ninth major section of 1 John, which is 1 John 4, 7 to 1 John 5, 3, to the tenth major section, uh, which is, be, uh, ends in 1 John 5, 12. So, uh, again, when it says, and his commitments are not burdensome, it's not only connected, connected to that previous com- uh, statement that we keep his commandments, that's defining love for God, but it's also beginning a new section in 1 John. As we'll ca- see, this is called a Janus section uh, when we t- with our interpreters. So, then we have the phrase of the word burdensome, and that pertains to that which is difficult, Uh, in view of its being burdensome or oppressive, or in other words, this word burdensome pertains to something being a source of difficulty or trouble because of the demands made by it. As we'll see, he's saying that God's commandments for us to obey them are not burdensome or oppressive or difficult for the child of God. And as we'll see, it's because, and we've seen in 1 John 3, 9, is because we have the nature of God. We have the spirit indwelling us. So we have the capacity to obey his commands because of this. So if you could, look at 1 John 5, 2 in my translation. Actually, if you could, look at 1 John 4, 7. I want to read the whole section in my translation. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 in my translation, please. And... It's on, on our website under the written library as well for those who are interested. So look at 1 John 4, 7 in my translation, please. And this will be the last time, the last evening that we read 1 John 4, 7 to 1 John 5, 3 like this. Because we're moving on. This first half, of, last half of this verse, 1 John 5, 3, begins a new section. So it says in 1 John 4, 7 in my translation, <clears throat> Beloved, let each one of us Continue to divinely love one another because this love is a characteristic originating from God. Now, let me interject something. One of the reasons, uh, main reason why I'm, I'm having you read this with me, again, because we've already read it in the Net Bible, is my translation is more interpretive and reflects my interpretation of, of these verses, which we've already covered. So it says, Beloved, let each one of us continue to divinely love one another because this love is a characteristic originating from God. Consequently, 
the one who at any time does divinely love has been fathered by God. And as a result, they know God experientially, have fellowship with him. The one who at any time does not practice divine love never enters into knowing God experientially because God is divine love. Now, knowing God experientially, as we pointed out, it speaks of fellowship with God but from the perspective of personally encountering God through learning and obeying his word and being affected by that encounter in the sense that you gain more of the character of Christ and you also gain more practical wisdom by experiencing fellowship with God, personally encountering God. Verse 9, by means of this, God's love entered into the state of being revealed because of each one of us. Namely, that God, that's the Father, dispatched into the world with authority his one and only Son in order that each one of us would conduct our lives through him. Love is defined by means of this, by no means that we're loving God, but rather that he himself, in contrast to us, loved each and every one of us. Specifically, he dispatched with authority his son to be the propitiatory sacrifice for each and every one of our sins. So there he, again, he's talking about the definition of love. Well, we're talking in the context, you know, we talk about the definition of love for God in 1 John 5, 3, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the definition of what is this divine love. Well, it, it, it's God manifesting it at the cross. We define God's love, uh, love, this love that he's talking about that we're supposed to operate in by what God did for us at the cross when we were his enemies. Verse 11, Beloved, if and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument, that God loved each and every one of us in this manner, and we all agree that he did, then each and every one of us are obligated to continue making it our habit of divinely loving one another. Notice the if and let us assume thing. That is because he's not, he could have just commanded them to do this, like he's done in the past. But no, he's using what in the Greeks we'd call a tool of persuasion. And so he was persuading them, I, I've reflected in my translation, he's persuading them in the original text of, to do this command. That's why you have the phrase, if and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument. That's what they would come across in Greek when they would debate each other. To, and you see some people do this even today. You don't see people talk this way too often, but this is how you do it. They're persuading each other. Uh, he's trying to persuade them to a particular course of action. And so then he goes on to say in verse 12, absolutely no one, at any time, has observed God. If any of us at any time does divinely love each other, this God is living in fellowship with us. Consequently, his love is accomplishing its purpose in us. By means of this, each one of us can at any time confirm that we're living in fellowship with him, and correspondingly, he is living in fellowship with us. Specifically, by means of his spirit as a source, who he has bestowed upon each one of us as a gift. Now you notice the word fellowship there with him, that phrase, you don't see it in your English translations because, again, I'm being more uh, interpretive. And the word fellowship with, uh, that is in fellowship with, is, is interpreting the, the pre- prepositional phrase in, in that word, the preposition there, is a marker of association. So I can translate it that way in fellowship with us because it's a marker of association. It's talking about the association between the father and the believer. So he goes on to say in verse 14, in fact, we have observed for ourselves so that each of us are now testifying that the father dispatched with authority his one and only son to save the world. Notice again, he's emphasizing, bringing back in the picture, God sacrificing his son at the cross for us. If anyone has confessed that Jesus is God's one and only son, then God is living in fellowship with him. Correspondingly, he himself is living in fellowship with God. Now again, you, you, what he's saying there is very significant in light of the, the Antichrist, the false prophets that he mentioned in chapter 2 and chapter 4, who rejected the fact that Jesus was both God and man. They rejected the fact that he was a human being. So that's called descetic Gnosticism. They can't get saved if they don't believe that Jesus is both God and man. And you can't have fellowship with God and the Son and the Spirit if you uh, turn around and, and, and adopt their teaching and you don't believe that Jesus is a human being anymore, that he's just God. Because the reason why that is, is you can't have fellowship with him if you're as a believer, if you adopt the, the teaching of the false prophets and the Antichrist, and you can't get saved in the first place if you adopt their teaching because the, God becoming a human being provided our so great salvation. If God the Son didn't become a human being, there'll be no op- chance whatsoever for us to receive the forgiveness of sins and have a relationship and a fellowship with the, uh, with the Trinity. And so if our salvation in the first place, our justification is based upon 
the, the person of Christ being both God and man, then so is our fellowship with God, which stems from our, our salvation and our eternal relationship with God. So then he goes on to say in verse uh, 16, correspondingly, each one of us knows God experientially. In other words, each one of us has believed that which constitutes divine love, which God has demonstrated because of each one of us. God is love. Consequently, the one who at any time does live by means of this love, does live in fellowship with God. Correspondingly, God does live in fellowship with him. By means of this, this divine love is accomplishing its purpose among each and every one of us so that each one of us would accomplish the Father's purpose of experiencing confidence on evaluation day because just as he himself does live, so also each one of us does live, he himself being Jesus. Now notice, um, if you compare my translation of, the, of verse 17 with verse 17 in your English Bibles, and I brought this out, the word perfect or perfected in your English translations, I'm translating it accomplishing the Father's purpose. So that's because that's the idea here. When he uses perfect in, those, in that verse or perfected, he's talking about the Father's purpose for manifesting his attribute of love at the cross through his Son. We accomplish that purpose of him revealing that love at the cross when we obey the command to love one another. So then he goes on to say, in verse, uh, in, uh, and where is it? Uh, in verse 18, he is experiencing absolutely no fear, living by means of that which constitutes divine love. On the contrary, accomplishing the purpose of manifesting this love does drive out this fear because this experience of fear does involve punishment. However, the one who does at any time cause himself to live in fear, the manifestation of this love is absolutely never accomplishing its purpose through the practice of this love. So we accomplish God's the purpose of God manifesting his love at the cross when we obey the command to love one another and correspondingly or consequently we are not having any fear at the Bama seat. We will not have fear at the Bama seat if we operate in God's love. And when we do that, we're accomplishing the purpose of him manifesting this love. So if you have fear of facing Christ at the Bama seat, it's because you're not operating in this love. Verse 19, each one of us does practice divine love because he himself in contrast to us, first loved each one of us. If in, that's echoing verse 10. If anyone enters into making the claim, I love God, and yet does hate at any time his fellow believer, then he is a liar. For the one who at any time does not divinely love his fellow believer, whom he has seen, causes himself to be totally unable to love God, whom he has never seen. Therefore, each one of us are under obligation to this command from him, namely, that the one who at any time does desire to divinely love God, must divinely love his fellow believer. Now, notice there what he's saying. Our love for God is manifested by obeying his commands and, and, and loving our fellow believer. He, remember, he's continuing the thought in chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 3. That helps us understand when he talks about love of God in verse 3 of chapter 5, he's speaking of love for God because of the statements he's making in verses 20 and 21 of, first, of chapter 4. Chapter 5, verse 1. No chapter break in the original. The thought is continuing. Anyone who at any time does believe that Jesus is the Christ that's been fathered by God, you're born again and saved. You have a, you're spiritually born. Uh, you become a child of God. Consequently, anyone who at any time does divinely love the Father, correspondingly does divinely love the one who's been fathered by him. By means of this, any one of us can at any time confirm that we're divinely loving God's children whenever any one of us does at any time divinely love God. Specifically, whenever any one of us does at any time obey his commands. Because this defines divine love, defines divine love for God. Namely, that each one of us does conscientiously obey his commands. So again, he says in, in verse 2, by means of this, any one of us can at any time confirm that we're divinely loving God's children when, when, whenever any one of us does at any time divinely love God. Specifically, whenever any one of us does at any time obey his commands. That is what loving God is about. Love for God. We obey his commands. Specifically, whenever any one of us does at any time obey his commands because this defines divine love for God. Namely, that each one of us does conscientiously obey his commands. And we'll stop there because that concludes the ninth major section of 1 John. So, what we see, verse 3, 1 John 5, 3, contains two declarations. The first, as you can see in my translation and yours, it asserts that divine love for God, the Father, is defined by the child of God conscientiously 
obeying the Father's commands. And this echoes what Jesus taught in John 14, 15. I brought this out last week. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commands, my commandments. And he actually is using the same language in 1 John 5, 3 as he does in 1 John 4, John 14, 15, the Gospel of John. Obviously, it makes, because John in 1 John is remembering what Jesus taught in the Upper Room Discourse as recorded in his Gospel, John chapters 13 through 17. Now, the second assertion in 1 John 5, 3 asserts that these commands are absolutely, absolutely never burdensome. Now, the first, uh, uh, the first assertion, our divine love for God is defined by the child of God conscientiously obeying the Father's commands. That's presenting the reason for the assertion recorded in verse 2, which teaches, as we just read, that the child of God can confirm they are divinely loving their fellow child of God by divinely loving the Father, which is accomplished by obeying his commands. So what is this telling us? It's Therefore, these verses 2 and 3 are teaching us that the child of God, that's you and I, can confirm we're divinely loving God, the Father. But we can confirm that we're divinely loving. Let me back it up. Verses 2 and 3. John's teaching us, the child of God, that we can confirm that we are divinely loving our fellow child of God by divinely loving the Father, and which, which is by, accomplished by obeying his commands because love for God the Father is defined by conscientiously obeying his commands. So, again, divinely love. I keep mentioning that. I mentioned it last week for those who might be new popping in. Divinely love. Is, this is a love that's, that when we, God says to love one another, He's not talking about a human love. This is something that's supernatural. It's accomplished in us when we obey what the Spirit's teaching us in the Scriptures. When He says to love one another, we obey that. The Spirit is working through us. And when we, when we accept by faith God the Father's love for us in the sacrifice of His Son, we gain the capacity to practice this love, the love that the Trinity has for each other. This love resides in the character and nature of the Trinity. It was manifested at the cross. We accepted this love at our justification, our conversion, when we trusted in Jesus as our Savior. And then we manifest that, this love when we obey this command to love one another. And we obey this command to love one another because God loved us first. And we, this, we uh, manifest this love by obeying the command to love one another because the Holy Spirit reproduces God's love in our lives when we obey this command that he's given to us. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. And it goes on to manif other manifestations of this. So that's why it's a div love that's divine. It's not, it's, 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 it's supernatural. It's from God. It resides in his character and nature. It's not the love between a husband and a wife and a, or a parent and their children or vice versa or, or the, a guy's love for his country. Or a woman's love for, a, for one's country. Is, or one's pet. No, it's, this is a love that is something that's supposed to be, will make all of our re human relationships so much better. If we operate in this love, it'll make our marriages better. It'll make our friendships better. And the, s the sad things, we, we, we can have a, a, a beautiful, fantastic human relationships, whether it's friendships or marriage, when we fall back on this love when the other person in the relationship becomes obnoxious to you or is a jerk to you or does something wrong to you, whether real or imagined. So this is the thing that will sustain your relationships or the relationships in your family between the kids and the parents. If the kids operate in love and forgive their parents for the things that they screw up and the parents do for the kids, you can have a great family life because let's face it, we're all sinners, are we not? And we screw up, and parents screw up, uh, uh, children screw up, that's obvious, parents do too. You know, it's not easy being a parent. Parents make mistakes too. And my parents made mistakes, but I don't hold it, I had a big problem with my father for the longest time, up until I was around mid-twenties, and then I started getting into the Word of God and learned a little teaching, I started to learn, I have to forgive my father. My, forgot, my father is a sinner just like I am. And my mother did things to me too, not that she bad things, you know, she didn't beat me up with a rod, but... You know, I did things. I did bad things to them too. I, we, we said stupid things to each other and hurtful things to each other. And what saved our relationship, especially between my father, is I found Jesus. And Jesus, more importantly, taught me. The Spirit taught me about Jesus' command and what it means to love. And when God told me, Bill, I forgave you. You can forgive your father. You've done worse to me than your father's ever done to you. So I learned to forgive. And that's 
that we talk about, you know, in the church, you know, Christian families need to practice this love. We, we, fr- Christian friendships need to practice this love. I've lost a lot of friends over the years because they couldn't forgive me for something. You know, and yet I, 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 would, those, I, I extend the olive branch to anybody, any person in my past. The trouble is they don't want to reconcile with me. Or they don't, here's the big thing, they don't want to apologize for their behavior. I, I have to apologize and I'll be more than willing to apologize for things I've said and done and have done that. I have no problem apologizing. I don't have that much pride. I, I mean, I have pride, but not in that area. I can apologize when I'm, when I'm wrong and I have done so. There are a lot of people in my life that are Christians that can't do that. They just will not apologize because they never do anything wrong. It's self-righteousness. You're not less of a person because you apologize. Men, you're not less of a man because you apologize to your wife. And parents, you're not a, less of a parent because you apologize to your kids. And children, you're not less uh, a, a, a person because you apologize to your parents. We can learn uh, in the congregation in the past, in the past of the congregation. Pride kills relationships. And we show pride by our, our unwillingness to confess our sins to one another, as James told us to do. When he says confess one's, our sins to one another, James 5, it's talking about an apology. You know, when you issue an apology to a person, you know, but that's all love. You know, we got to forgive each other. Because God has forgiven us. There's no, you, you can't if, ands, or buts about it. You can't get around it. You can't, you can't say no to that. You can, but you're, only, you're out of fellowship with God, and God will discipline you. As if you're gonna if you're gonna be stubborn and stick to that and not, you know, and not operate in love and forgive that person or be patient with that person or tolerant with each other, that's very important. So we can we you know we can have great relationships, Christian relationships, whether it's in friendships or marriages or whatnot, families. But you can destroy even Christian marriages and families and friendships by failing to operate in this love. And if we there's no excuse for not operating in this love. God forgave you. How often did God sent his one and only son to the cross for us and we were his enemies when he did that. Now, we're all in the family of God together. I don't think we, there's any, I mean, you got to be like, like not listening to me and you don't want to listen to me. I know that can happen too. But what, what does that tell you? I need to stop holding a grudge and holding an attitude toward my brother and sister in Christ, whoever they may be. Got to forgive because God has forgiven us. We're obligated to. So, therefore, first John, in 1 John 5, verses 2 and 3, John's teaching that the child of God can confirm they are divinely loving their fellow child of God by divinely loving their fa- the Father. And how is that accomplished? It's accomplished by obeying His commands, and this is true because love for God is defined by conscientiously observing His commands. So you know, if you're loving God, do you obey His commands? Are you practicing the command to love one another? Do you know what it means to practice the command to love one another? I've gone through the one another, various one another commands of scripture. Prohibitions and commands. And what they, what we, they teach us how this love looks, what it looks like. So this is very important. So his commands, his commands, appear, don't worry about her. His commands appear in both assertions in 1 John 5.3 and 1 John 5.2. When he says his commands, that appears in 1 John 5.3 and it appears in 1 John 5.2. And in each instance, people, it refers to the Father's commands, which his son Jesus Christ communicated by the Spirit directly to his apostles, who in turn, by the Spirit, communicated them to the church. They can be summarized as loving one another, as he loved the believer, which demonstrates our love for God. So his commands, it doesn't refer as it did in 1 John 3, 23 and 24 to the command at justification that the unregenerate sinner must trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior in order to be declared justified by the Father and the command to love one another. So 1 John 3, 23 and 24, we saw that the command was twofold. To believe in Jesus Christ, to be declared justified, to get saved, in other words, and the second command was to love one another. So that's not what's going on in 1 John 5, 2, and 3 when we see the phrase, his commands. This is indicated by the fact that John is speaking in the context of how a child of God can confirm that they're divinely loving the Father, which is not by trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior, but by divinely loving their fellow child of God. Furthermore, the the non-believer does not have the capacity to divinely love God until they receive the Spirit. 
which they will receive a justification. Only believers can love like God does. So that's why I say what I say. His commands is referring to stuff that's related to the believer only, the child of God. Lastly, further indicating that the plural form of entele in the Greek commands or commandments in 1 John 5, 2 is referring to the various one other commands is that John is attempting to identify for the recipients of 1 John how they can confirm that they divinely love God's children. Of course, it is through obedience to the command to love one another. So therefore, his commands, or his commandments in 1 John 5, 2, and 3, it refers to the various one another commands in the New Testament, which can be summarized by the command to love one another, and which command is recorded in John 13, 34, and, and John 14, uh, 15, 12. It's found in those verses. So, uh, hold, your pla- uh, hold your place. Look at 1 John chapter... Uh, First John. Go to John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 34. We've been to this command quite a bit. Let's go again. John 13, John 13, 34. I give you a new commandment. Again, we're going to this passage because his commands in 1 John 5, 2 and 3, speaking of the, the various com- one another commands in Scripture, which can be summarized as to love one another. So Jesus taught this in John 13, 34. Uh, John, yeah, John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 34. I give you a new commandment. Not new in time, because they were told to love your neighbor in the past, in the, in the Old Testament. It's new in quality and character, because Jesus perfectly manifested loving your neighbor. Per, he perfectly loved his neighbor. I give you a new commandment to love one another, not as yourself, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. Why does he say, not you love, love your neighbor as yourself? Why does he say, love as I loved you? Because he perfectly loved his neighbor as himself. He gave them a perfect example to follow. So everyone will know by this, if you love one another, that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. So here's another thing we've been bringing out. If you want to show the people that you're a disciple of Jesus and you want to manifest God's love to the non-believer, practice this command with your fellow Christian. That's an, it's an evangelistic tool. People are looking for love everywhere. And they're looking for love in all the wrong places, like the country song says. Well, you can find it, and you should be finding this love in the Christian church. How sad when the Christian church doesn't practice this love with each other, and the non-believer doesn't see us any different than, than their, their contemporaries, their un, non-believing friends and family members. So we, gotta, we, we can manifest the supernatural deity when we obey this command and practice love with each other. That's what he's talking about. John, look at John 15. While you're in, uh, actually, while you're in John, look at 14.15 first. John 14.15. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Commandments, the same word that you see in 1 John 5. And to lay. It's in the plural form. My commandments. If you love me, you will obey my commands. So we saw in 1 John 5, 2 and uh, for, was it 1 John 4, 20 to 1 John 5, 3. We're talking about the believer's love for God. Well, Jesus is saying the same criteria that John says to love, to defy, that defines loving the Father, which is obeying his commands, is the same criteria that Jesus uses for the Father. Well, they should because they're both co-equal, co-infinite, co-eternal. They're both God. One's the Father, one's the Son. If you love me, this is the condition. You will obey my commandments. You will obey my commandments is the condition that must be filled if you love Jesus and love the Father. So, now we're talking about, if you uh, um, go to Philippians. Go to Philippians chapter 2. So we're talking about obedience to God's commands, the one and the commands of Scripture. Remember, the Father gave these commands through His Son, by the Spirit, and He communicated in the church, and the apostles communicated these commands that can be summarized by loving one another. He communicated it, they communicated it to the church. It's in our New Testament. The Spirit's speaking to us, which he's inspired the New Testament. He's speaking to us as the pastor communicates the word of God. And he's talking about this love. And so when we obey the command to love one another, 
and the ver- which are summarize the various one another commands of Scripture, when we obey, we, we're showing our love for God, our obedience, our obedience to His commands shows that we love God. It's visible proof that we love God. Because I say this because there's a lot of Christians who say, "I love God," and yet they don't know God's word. How can you love God when you don't know his word? You don't. Why do you think we spend so much time teaching the word of God here? We make it an issue here. Because it was an, Jesus taught daily in the temple. The apostles taught all the time. They taught, when they were allowed to be in the temple, they taught daily in the temple. We try to make the word of God it's, it's so critical, available to people, the body of Christ. That's what our, our mission is is to get the word of God out to God's people and the gospel to the non-believer. But we're here, my gift, the exercise of my gift is related to the church. And so I'm trying to get you the word of God. You don't, you can't love God if you don't know God's word. You can't pray, be an effective prayer word if you don't know God's word because God's word reveals God's will and we're supposed to pray according to God's will. And if we don't know God's word, we can't obey it. If we, can't, if we don't obey it, then we're not, we have no way of loving God. And if we have no way of loving, if we're not loving God because we're not obeying his word, we're not having fellowship with God, which is why we're here. So everything is tied to our obedience to God's word. We can't, we, obedience has to have an object. It's God's word. So if we obey God's word, we're having fellowship with God, we're being able to pray effectively, we're demonstrating our love for God, and we're, 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 uh, we're in the process going to evangelize the non-Christian community. But who's, our, who's, who's the one that, we, uh, that the Bible holds up as the perfect, who set the perfect, uh, was perfect in his obedience to his heavenly father? Jesus. Look at Philippians 2.1. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort provided by love, any fellowship in the spirit, any affection or mercy, complete my joy and be of the same mind by having the same love, being united in spirit and having one purpose. Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition, or vanity. Each of you should in humility be treated, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. That's, that's a manifestation of obeying the command to love one another. If you consider the other person is more important than yourself, serving them, you are practicing the command to love one another. Because that's what Jesus did. Keep reading. Verse 4, each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but about the interests of others as well. When you do that, you're obeying the command to love one another. Jesus did that. In fact, He's going to give you the perfect example of this, of obedience. Jesus. Verse 5. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. What's that attitude? Uh, That you treat others more important than yourself. That you're concerned not only with your own interests, but the interests of others. That's what Jesus did perfectly. So you should have the same attitude toward one another that Jesus, Christ Jesus had. Now listen to me. The world doesn't operate that, that way. Everybody's looking out for their own interests. Now, I know some people say, well, I look out for my family's interests. But being out for your family's interests is really looking out for your own interests, isn't it? It's your flesh and blood. It's your wife. It's your kids. Of course, you're going to be looking. It's, it, by doing that, they're an extension of you. Of course, you're going to take good care of them, unless you're divorced to your wife and you don't want to have anything to do with her, right? But people who look out for their own, it's their own interest to do take care of their kids. And look out. But what about, how about looking out for somebody else's kids? <laughs> how about looking out for your enemies? You know, how about looking at, thinking about them? I mean, do you do things for the benefit of your enemies? I mean, do we do think that way? No, the world doesn't think anything but it's for itself. Because we're the world, we're all sinners, and we live in the devil's world. And the mo for that, this world, the devil's world, and sinners is look out for your own interests. Look out for number one, and let everybody worship you, or let everybody give you. Uh, you know, how many likes can I get on Facebook, or how many, how many, how much attention can I get on Twitter? You know, how many? You know, it's just. We're so occupied with ourselves and we're so miserable. No wonder we have the highest suicide rate in the, in the, in the world. The United States of America. And you even get suicide in the church. How in the world? Because we're full of ourselves. We're self, self-absorbed. And Jesus wasn't that way. Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus had more, and the apostles weren't that way, and the prophets of Israel weren't that way, and they had more trouble and trials and tribulations than any of us Christians in America in the 21st century have ever faced. Yet we, what we, we're all about of ourselves. You want to be miserable, be all about yourself. Jesus, follow Jesus' example, who is happy. Even when he was mistreated, he was being, how could you say that's an oxymoron, Bill? He was, knew that there was a purpose for his suffering, and it's the same thing for us. If we obey God, and we get suffer for it, there's a purpose for it. 
We're going to glorify God. We're going to get rewards at the Bema seat. We're going to, live, we're going to be in the, uh, rulers in the, in the millennial kingdom. I mean, that in itself, and we, just to please our Heavenly Father should be enough. Just that, that it makes Him happy, and Jesus happy, should be enough to be obedient to Him, even if it, if it costs us, it, it, it results in undeserved suffering, and we're mistreated. You know, look at Paul, and, and we read First Thessalonians, the Thessalonians were new believers. They weren't even believers for a year, and they were persecuted for their faith, yet they were rejoicing. What Christians today, they get a flat tire, or something happens, and they, they want to, you know, they, they're, they go into this tremendous, draw the shades, and, oh, woe is me. You know, we're, we're crazy in our country, right? We shouldn't be that way. We should be looking out for the interests of others. We'll be much happier for it. And it's against our nature. So don't... Everybody is guilty of this. We, it's against our nature. What I'm telling you is, you got to go and look how God's treated you. Did he look, if God was looking out just for his own interest, he wouldn't have bothered going to the cross for us, I don't think. Would he? Maybe he would have. Yeah, probably would have. But he sent his son to the cross for us when we were opposing him. And yet, you know, how, that's how we're supposed to act the same way. So he says, who... Verse, verse 6, who although he exists in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, or made himself of no reputation, by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men. He did this all because he's love. He does not love for us. And by sharing in human nature, he humbled himself. Look, look at this. Humility is required to be obedient. He humbled himself. How did he do that? By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So, humility, it takes humility to be obedient to the point of death. Jesus suffered undeserved suffering, suffering on the cross. He didn't deserve it. We deserve the suffering that he, he, he faced. But he, took, he did it out of love for us. He became a servant to serve us sinners who were his creatures who opposed him, who were, in the, who, were, who were fighting against him, and yet he still suffered in love, humbled himself, giving us a perfect example, and he humbly obeyed, obeyed his father because his father wanted to save us through his, his death. It hasn't stopped there yet. Look what he says in verse 9. As a result, God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus was rewarded for his obedience. So will we. So will we. We'll be rewarded for our obedience, and our obedience in the face of undeserved suffering and persecution. God will reward us as well. And we have a perfect example to follow Jesus of obedience. So go back now to 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. 1 John 5, 3. So obedience to God's commands, the various commands, one another commands of scripture that can be summarized as loving one another. Obedience to these commands constitutes divine love for the Father. Further supporting this interpretation is that John is attempting to define for the recipients of 1 John love for God the Father. Again, trusting in Jesus Christ as one Savior does not define love for God because the unsaved sinner does not have the capacity to divinely love God until they receive the Holy Spirit and are regenerated, which they will receive at justification. In other words, they don't have the capacity to obey these commands until they become children of God through faith alone and Jesus Christ alone. Only believers can love like God since the believer's divine love originates with God's character and it's reproduced in them when they accept by faith his love for them, which was manifested through the sacrifice of his one and only son on the cross. Also, God's love is reproduced in his children when they obey the spirit-inspired command to love one another. In John, 1 John 5.3, John speaks of conscientious obedience to the Father's commands. You see, keep his commandments. The words tereo. It speaks of conscientious obedience. You could translate it. So what does it mean to be conscientious? Well, if you look up Webster's, it means to be careful, thoughtful, heedful, attentive, meticulous. So what John's saying with this word is not just keep. John's teaching that divine love for God the Father is defined by the child of God being careful, thoughtful, heedful, attentive, meticulous in conforming their thoughts and actions in compliance with his commands. 
conscientious, when somebody's conscientious, would you say somebody's conscientious, uh, if you gave your kid a chance to do it, uh, well, you know, let's say, uh, what's the word? My father, he'd say, all right, um, he would, uh, he'd tell me, okay, I want you to go and uh, do a particular task. And if I was messy in the task or I was, uh, you know, I didn't pay attention to details, I wasn't being conscientious. Um, so if you want to be, con- God wants you to be, you and I to be conscientious. He wants us to be careful about what we're learning in the word of God. Thoughtful, think about it. Heedful, attentive, paying attention to when his word's being taught. Being meticulous in conforming our thoughts and our actions in compliance with his word and his various commands. So conscientious obedience. You know, one of the things that makes a great employee is they're conscientious. I remember my father, I said this in the past, my father, I looked at it, he had this, he had this like, not a yearbook, but they had this book uh, they had uh, about their company, this company he was at, he was in the printing in, uh, printing in business, he made mixed and matched colors, and he, that was all formulas, and, uh, and so he did that, he was very, uh, pretty well known in that field, and uh, he retired from it you know, many years ago, and he loved that business, but he, one of the things I saw in the book they said at this company of his was, Bill's very, Bill Wentz, he's very conscientious, was one of the descriptions of him. And my father instilled that in all of us to be like that. So you want, when you, somebody does it, my dad would say, you know, when you're doing a job, I don't care if it's, you know, we used to, uh, he used to have us clean the bowling alley. He used to have three, he used to have three jobs at one time. He'd have that job, and he would go cater, and he used to have this bowling alley job where, you know, it worked in this Kenilpin bowling alley in Massachusetts. And, uh, on Sunday mornings, he'd take us kids. When I was a little kid, we'd take us there and we'd clean. I would clean the men's and the ladies' room, the bowling alleys. And that was the day when there was public smoking. And the ashtrays were disgusting with cigarette butts and all that stuff. And I had to clean all that stuff in the ladies' bathroom and the men's bathroom. It was disgusting, you know, a lot of things. But, and he would go in there and you, you, you better do a good job. If he saw you weren't, it wasn't, you know, I wouldn't come with a glove or anything like that. But he would make sure that you did a good job because... It reflected on him if it wasn't done a good job. You know, who wants to, you know, the boss walk in and, you know, he sees, you know, this stuff still on the floor. You missed this. What are you doing here? And my father, you know, we'd be cleaning, you know, like the, the, uh, the tables. And he said, Billy, you missed a spot here. You know, and, you know, of course, we whine about it. And he said, don't whine about it. It's just that you didn't do it. I want you to do it. You good job. I and mean, we were talking and we, we were talking to each other and we'd stop working. My father says, can't you work and talk at the same time? It's like, you know, obviously we're like, you know, like 12 years old. <laughs> Who does it 12 years old? Well, he taught me to do that. You know, now I catch myself doing that to, you know, kids that, you know, young kids. And I said, can't you work and talk at the same time? <laughs> And if they're smart, they say, I can't chew gum and walk at the same time. That's what I would say. But there's a wise guy. So you've got to be conscientious. Pay attention to what you're doing. So that's why, you know, when I'm, when I'm teaching the word of God, when I'm, I'm getting, I prepare my lessons, I mean, people, have, people have no idea. I'm, I'm very conscientious about what I'm doing. I care, meaning I care about what I'm doing. But before I give you the lesson, I've worked on this passage for a long time. And I care about what I do. And if, if there's any criticism I could ever get, it's probably I give, I, I give too much. But it's not because of lack of effort. I've I've tried to do try to be conscientious in doing what I'm doing. I mean, you know, obviously I, I strike out at times. I've tried I strike out, but you know, you can't say I didn't try. I mean, I I've def- because I try because I'm conscientious. I care about what I'm doing, and that's what God's talking about. In this we have to be conscientious about obeying His commands. So that means you got to learn and care about God's word. You want to be a student of God's word, and you can't. I, I, there's no getting around it. You, you've got to use your brain to study the Bible. I'm sorry. You just have to. I know it's not popular in our culture, but yeah, you have to take some thinking. It takes some work. It's just like anything else in life. If you want to be good at it, you've got to put the work in. You know, I've said this about music. You know, I said kids over the years, you want to, they want to learn the guitar. They see me play. They think I just rolled out of bed. And I, I've been praying for four years, 40 years. I actually was a much better lead, lead player than I am now tw- 20 years ago. But... I mean, I, I work my butt off. I practice seven hours a day many times for years. And, you know, kids come in, they think, of, you know, oh, just, and I can tell they're not practicing. So I don't, I don't give lessons anymore because the kids don't want to, they don't want to, the kids I've run into, they don't want to work at it. It's like, don't waste my time and your time. I'm not going to take your money and, uh, because you're not practicing. I can tell immediately if you're not practicing. Well, they're not being conscientious. They're not doing what I'm telling them to do. And that's, I don't have, I don't have, to, I, I don't have, 
time for that. I don't have, it's not that I don't have patience. I just don't have the time to waste. I have to, my, life, my time is too important to me to spend around with a, a, a kid who doesn't want to do the work that I gave him, you know, 10, 15 minutes of uh, instruction, and they don't even practice. Lack of being, not being conscientious. If you want, it's Christianity. You got to study your Bible. You got to make it an effort to pray and study your Bible and not just come to Bible class. You have your own private sanctified time, God's word. That's it. You have to use your brain because to be, to be conscientious in your obedience, you have to be, use your brain. You have to be thoughtful about God's word. You have to be attentive to God's word, meticulous. Now, so, the second assertion, which well, I want to wrap up our lesson tonight quickly with this last uh, assertion. The second assertion in 1 John 5, 3, as I pointed out, is not only connected to the first assertion, but is also marking a transition here. Look at my translation of 1 John 5, 2 and 3 again, please. <coughs> By means of this, any one of us can at any time confirm that we're divinely loving God's children. Whenever any one of us does at any time divinely love God. Specifically, whenever any one of us does at any time obey his commands. Because this defines divine love for God. Namely, that each one of us does conscientiously obey his commands. Then he says, now his commands are absolutely never characterized as burdensome. So, as I said, that second assertion that God's commands are not burdensome. That's a Janus section. It's ending. The, 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 third, the ninth major section is done. This word, for this second assertion is starting a new section. The tenth major section of 1 John, which ends at 1 John 5.12. Now, as we noted, both statements speak of the Father's commands. However, the second assertion, which speaks about God's commands never being burdensome, marks a transition to a new section because this new section no longer speaks of loving God the Father by obeying his command to love one another, which dominated the ninth major section. Rather, this new section asserts that the child of God's belief that Jesus is the Son of God has not only given them the capacity to obey the Father's commands, but also has given them the victory over Satan's cosmic world system and organization. So this second assertion in 1 John 5, 3 states that the Father's commands are not burdensome, or we could say oppressive. What is that? Uh, the first assertion in 1 John 5, 4 presents the reason for that assertion by stating that everyone who's been born of God overcomes Satan's world system and organization. Then John identifies specifically what gives the child of God the victory over Satan, namely their faith. And 1 John 5.5, 5, John teaches that if it is a specifically the child of God's faith, that Jesus is the Son of God, which gives them this victory over the devil. Look at your translation of 1 John 5.3. Look at 1 John 5.3. It says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And then he says, in his commandments, do not weigh us down. Because everyone who has been fathered by God conquers the world. The world is Satan's world system and organization. This is the conquering power that has conquered the world. Our faith. Now who is the person who has conquered the world? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So, we see that these three assertions in 1 John 5, 3, the, to, all the way, uh, 1 John 5, 3, 5, 4, and 5, 5. Those assertions are teaching that the Father's commands are not burdensome because the child of God's faith, that is, Jesus is the Son of God, gives them the victory over Satan. Also, these assertions are teaching that the Father's commands are never burdensome to the child of God because they are born of God as a result of their faith that Jesus is the Son of God. So thus, when they became children of God, through faith in His one and only Son, they received the nature of God, and thus the capacity to obey the Father's commands. So we saw that in 1 John 3, 9 about this new nature that we have. Paul talks about it in Colossians and in Romans. So consequently, the commands of the Father are absolutely never burdensome to his children because they share his nature. Is it difficult for God to practice this love? No, because it's part of his nature. Well, we have received the nature of God at the moment of our justification, our conversion, which now gives us the capacity to obey these commands. And why do we have the nature of God? We have the Trinity indwelling us. And he mentions the Spirit, because the Spirit is the, the member of the Trinity that reproduces this love in us when we obey what the Spirit is saying in the Word of God. So therefore, and we'll close here, the second assertion in 1 John 5, 3, God's commands are never burdensome, is a Janus section, we call it. It's a term named after a Roman god of doorways with one head and two faces looking in opposite directions. And it's a term applied to a literary unit 
that looks back and forth to unite the units before and after. So when he says God's commands are not burdensome, well, the phrase commands are joined to the previous section and burdensome is related to the, full, the next section to follow. So therefore, this assertion in 1 John 5, 3 unites the child of God's obedience to the Father's commands with their faith that Jesus is the Son of God which resulted in their becoming children of God. So now we're going to talk, start a lot of talking about, a lot about faith. And when we have faith in God's word, it appropriates the omnipotence of the spirit and that gives us the power that we need to obey his commands, which can be summarized as to love one another. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray this lesson be a blessing to your people. And we thank you for everyone here this evening. We pray this would help them in their walk with God and their obedience to your word and obeying this command to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.